This is our last session of the uh, C.S. Lewis program, and this one is on the Chronicles of Narnia. And I picked three that I thought were representative of the Chronicles and also uh, among my favorites. Uh, the Magician's Nephew, The Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe, and The Last Battle. Uh, this is the cover of uh, The Magician's Nephew from the book that I am using to make this uh, presentation. And uh, if you'll notice, it says book six in the Chronicles. Now, all the recent versions of the Narnia Chronicles uh, have this as uh, book one, uh, the first book of the series. Um, this was really the order in which Lewis wrote the Chronicles. He wrote this one. Uh, at, in the sixth uh, place in the Chronicles. And the reason he wrote it is because he kept getting these messages and letters from children that said, how did Narnia begin? What was Narnia all about? So he thought, I must write a book that has uh, the beginning of Narnia in it. And so he wrote The uh, Magician's Nephew after getting all these letters from children. And, but it's the one that is now uh, first. Uh, and I did have a friend, some of you that were here perhaps a uh, long time ago when we had our C.S. Lewis class here, remember a uh, professor by the name of Dabney Hart. And Dabney was a C.S. Lewis scholar and did write a book about his nonfiction, all of his academic work. And I asked her one time, she was a friend of mine, I asked her one time whether she thought children should read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe first or The Magician's Nephew first. And she said she thought they should read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe first because she said she thought it was the better book uh, and would draw the children into it more. And that was, of course, the whole point was to get children involved in the whole series. So I'm neutral about it. I think you, it, they're both wonderful stories, and you could get involved either way in, in uh, reading uh, The Magician's Nephew first or in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe first. But we're going to take them in this order because The Magician's Nephew is the genesis of Narnia, the beginning of Narnia. This is the first or sixth book in Lewis's famous series. He wrote it in response to letters from children asking how Narnia came to be. There continues to be a debate over the proper order in which these books should be read. Some uh, believing, believe in reading The Magician's Nephew first, which is the chronological order, and others believe in reading the published order, putting The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe first. As I said, I don't really think it matters uh, whichever one uh, will uh, bring the children into the series is the one that I would support. The uh, Magician's Nephew is a thrilling adventure about two children, a wicked uncle, an evil queen, and a myriad of other colorful characters, including the great Lion Aslan. It is a creation story about the founding of Narnia. Polly and Diggory are two children who live next door to each other in London in the early 1900s. Diggory's mother is ill and dying, and his father is in India. They are living with Uncle Andrew and his sister. One day, Polly and Diggory decide to explore the passageway which runs behind all of the row houses in their neighborhood. They are hoping to get into and explore a deserted house in the row. Instead, they miscalculate and end up in Uncle Andrew's study. Uncle Andrew is a practicing magician who has created yellow, ring, yellow and green rings from ancient powder. The powder is supposed to come from Atlantis. And here is a picture of Polly and Diggory creeping along the attic, which is just a wonderful scene for children to imagine uh, 
all these doors on the attic and they're trying to get into the deserted house but they end up in the uncle's study. He tricks the children into putting on the yellow rings which transport them to a wooded area with many pools of water. In each pool there is a different world and Polly and Diggory end up in the world of Charn, which is a dying world once ruled by the evil queen Jadis. The queen is under a spell which can only be broken by ringing a tiny bell which has a warning that Diggory disobeys. That's very important, disobedience. Jadis is restored to life by the ringing of that bell and ends up with the children in London, back in the woods, and finally into the new world being created by Aslan, where she becomes known actually as the White Witch. Uh, Jadis is seven feet tall, and she is gorgeous, and Diggory is a little smitten with her. And Uncle Andrew is even more smitten with her. And that's just one of many pictures of Jadis. She creates havoc wherever she goes. Andrew, Uncle Andrew and Jadis, these two characters are representative of the Nietzschean Superman. They are figures who care nothing for anyone that cannot be used to gain power and wealth. They consider themselves to be above the law and above the ordinary standards of good and evil. As Uncle Andrew says to Diggory, who had asked him about keeping promises, but of course you must understand that rules of that sort, however excellent they may be for little boys and servants and women and even people in general, can't possibly be expected to apply to profound students and great thinkers and sages. No, Diggory, men like me who possess hidden wisdom are freed from common rules. Is this beginning to remind you of anything? <laughs> and Queen Jadis. When Diggory asked her why she had destroyed her own kingdom, and world, she replied, I had forgotten you are only a common boy. How should you understand reasons of state? You must learn, child, that what would be wrong for you or any of the common people is not wrong for such a queen as I. The weight of the world is on our shoulders. We must be freed from all rules. But <clears throat> this is one of my favorite lines in the series. Diggory remembers his fairy tales. And so Diggory says, very well, this is to Uncle Andrew, I'll go to rescue Polly, but there's one thing I jolly well mean to say first. I didn't believe in magic till today. I see now it's real. Well, if it is, I suppose all the old fairy tales are more or less true. And you're simply a wicked, cruel magician like the ones in the stories. Well, I've never read a story in which people of that sort weren't paid out in the end. And I'll bet you will be and serve you right. <clears throat> Lewis loved fairy tales. He read them all his life. He thought that they were important for adults to read as well as uh, children. And. Um, the, this is what he had to say about it in a little book of essays that he gave to Charles Williams, or was written in honor of Charles Williams after he died. It is usual to speak in a playfully apologetic tone about one's adult enjoyment of what are called children's books. I think the convention a silly one. No book is really worth reading at the age of 10 which is not equally and far more often worth reading at the age of 50 or older or younger. When one rereads a story, one is looking for a quality, not the fact. And this was really important to C.S. Lewis, uh, and he talked a lot about rereading uh, stories. And he said that the children understand this very well when they ask for the same story over 
and over and over again. And in the same words, those of you who have read to young children know that when you miss a word, they usually are quick to correct you and say, no, it's not, it's not right. You're not reading this right. They want to have the surprise of discovering that what seemed Little Red Riding Hood's grandmother is really the wolf. And I think this is a really uh, important uh, part of um, point that Lewis liked to make, that rereading was particularly important because you're rereading not for the plot or what happens, but you are rereading to get some essence from the story that you might have missed when you were looking for the, the plot. So Aslan begins the creation in The Magician's Nephew. In the world, new world of Narnia, after creating the beasts, Aslan selects some to become talking animals, makes the London cabbie and his wife king and queen of Narnia, and sends Diggory to a world beyond Narnia to bring back the apple, which eventually becomes the wardrobe in the most famous of the series. The Magician is the Genesis story of Narnia. Like Eve, Diggory is tempted, but unlike Eve, he resists in order to save his mother. However, uh, despite their best efforts, Polly and Diggory bring Queen Jadis, Uncle Andrew, and Evil into the new world of Narnia. Jadis eats one of the forbidden apples and so will live forever. But Lewis says that it will bring her neither joy nor rest because she was disobedient. She did what Aslan told her not to do. She retains her evil and becomes the white witch in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So basically that is sort of the story of the genesis of Narnia, how it was created. And if you haven't read it, I urge you to read it. It's a, it's a beautiful story of creation and very much uh, in keeping with the, the biblical Genesis story. Now, let's look just for a minute at The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. This famous book came about because of images that popped into Lewis's head of a fawn carrying an umbrella, a queen on a sleigh, and a powerful lion. He decided to write these characters into stories using the fairy tale form. He did not set out to create Christian allegories, but the parallels appear nevertheless. However, many children and adults never make the connection, and this would suit Lewis just fine. Uh, he wanted people to get the real truth, the real essence, and he didn't care whether you made a literal connection uh, to the biblical story uh, or not. And in fact, I always, when I was uh, raising my children and teaching children always said to teachers, do not tell them uh, about the parallel. Uh, let them either discover it or not discover it. Uh, and I remember my own children read them all and many years later it occurred to them that, oh, this is like the biblical stories. So, uh, I think it's, it's better not to really have that in mind. Here are the pictures that Lewis had in his mind, or some in artist's interpretation of the pictures. This is Mr. Tumnus, the fawn with the umbrella. The white witch, this is from the movie, uh, the Narnia, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, and then, of course, the great lion, Aslan. The story is something like this. Four children sent from London to the country during World War II discover a mysterious world by going through the back of a wardrobe. There, one of them becomes a traitor. They all encounter evil through the White Witch and goodness and power through Aslan the Great Lion. Most of us have read the story or seen the movie. Now, this is a little aside. I do not know how many movies C.S. Lewis watched in his life, but this is what he had to say about film. 
Nothing can be more disastrous than the view that the cinema can and should replace popular written fiction. The elements which it excludes are precisely those which give the untrained mind its only access to the imaginative world. There is death in the camera. So we can talk about this later, you can make a mental note to come back to this. Imagine what Lewis would have thought of current television viewing, social media, and video games, and his own books made into movies. Uh, people read for many reasons, and Lewis's opinion was that popular fiction did quite frequently pierce through a reader's momentary interest in the plot or action to something akin to a religious experience. That's popular fiction, he thought that. But Lewis felt that the same thing did not happen as well when viewing film. So he was thought, read the, read the uh, uh, dime store novels, uh, but don't bother with the films. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe has done for many readers what George MacDonald's fantasies did for Lewis. That is, this book and the others in the series have the potential to baptize our imaginations with glimpses of deeper reality. We now know, thanks to our physicists and everything, that everything in the universe <clears throat> is made of ancient moving stardust. How far is that fact from a materialistic, deterministic universe, and how much closer to myth, poetry, and Narnia? So we've had a, a couple of, of uh, sessions in Sunday school classes about uh, physicists and how closely connected they are to the origins of life. And in fact, some of them do call the um, what everything is made of, stardust. Uh, and so you think about that, and then you think about um, uh, Lewis's uh, children's books. As the professor Diggory, grown up, explains, if there really is a door in this house that leads to some other world, I should not be at all surprised to find that that other world had a separate time of its own so that however long you stayed there, it would never take up any of our time. But do you really mean, sir, said Peter, that there could be other worlds all over the place, just around the corner like that? Nothing is more probable, said the professor, taking off his spectacles and beginning to polish them while he muttered to himself, I wonder what they do teach them at these schools. So Lewis was familiar with the physicists in the 50s uh, and 40s. And of course now there's a whole uh, body of fact that talk about the other worlds that might exist uh, you know, to, to solve a lot of physics problems. Lewis wrote that to be stories at all, they must be series of events. But it must be understood that this series, the plot, as we call it, is only really a net whereby to capture something else. The real theme may be, and perhaps usually is, something that has no sequence in it, something other than a process, and much more like a state or quality. If the magician's nephew is the Genesis story of Narnia, the last battle is the revelation end of the time story. All right, so we're going to move now to the final book of the series, uh, The Last Battle. The Last Battle, these two characters, this is a donkey in a, uh, lamb's, a lion's skin. Uh, his name is Puzzle, and this is the ape shift who uh, is very uh, rebellious and has rebelled against Narnia. Uh, this is the story of the end of Narnia. In it, we can see parts of biblical revelations and parts of astrophysics. 
Biblical scholars and cosmic scientists tell us that the world and indeed the universe will end one day. Narnia ended in 1949 in English years and 2,555 in Narnian years. And people uh, asked Lewis about his timeline, so he drew up a timeline after the fact. He had had this in mind. So this is what his timeline looked like. Of course, there are many. He put in there all of the other stories and things that happened. So Narnia in 2,555, this is what happened. We have the rebellion of Shift, the ape, King Tyrion, who is the last king of Narnia, rescued by Eustace and Jill, who appeared in the silver chair. Narnia in the hands of the Calamines, the last battle and the end of Narnia. England, 1949, parallel, a serious accident on the British railways. And you're going to see that that accident uh, killed all of the uh, family uh, that were in the line of the witch in the wardrobe, all but one. And we'll talk about that one that was missing. <clears throat> this is the story of the last battle. Shift, a Machiavellian ape, persuades Puzzle, an old and trusting donkey, to dress up in an old lion skin and pretend to be Aslan. Many Narnians are fooled and confused by Shift's attempt to take control of the country by use of this false Aslan. Many uh, thousand years, hundreds of years, have passed now since the creation of Narnia in Narnia. And they haven't seen Aslan for a long time. Meanwhile, the neighboring Calamines, ruled by the dictator, Rishda, take advantage of this confusion and invade Narnia with the goal of making slaves of all of its citizens. The Calamines worship the evil deity Tash, who they decide to call Tashlan, to further confuse the Narnians. And, he, and this is what he looks like. He has the head of a bird, four arms, claws that come out and is clearly uh, monstrous. King Tyrion, along with Jill and Eustace and Tyrion's best friend, the unicorn Jewel, and other loyal Narnians fight a last battle in front of the stable where Shift has been holding puzzle. And this is one of the pictures of the battle. And here is another picture of the battle, and you can see the Calamines uh, a little bit more in there. Um, the stripe uh, warriors are the Calamines. Jill says when it looks quite certain that they are to be killed, I was going to say I wished we'd never come, but I don't, I don't, I don't, even if we are killed. I'd rather be killed fighting for Narnia than grow old and stupid at home and perhaps go about in a bath chair, which is a wheelchair, and then die in the end just the same. And the die in the end just the same is another theme that runs through all of Lewis's works because he said that no matter what happens, everybody dies, including the world, and the universe. So that's a thought that one could spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, the stable and the dwarves. The stable is the doorway to the real world of Aslan. And as the Narnians enter, they are greeted by Aslan himself. Some of them are die, have uh, been killed in battle and thrown into the stable and some go into the stable to see what is actually going on there. They have, of course, died, most of them, but Lewis makes it very clear in the last chapter of the last battle that what happens after death depends on what you are willing to believe. Aslan gives the dwarves food and rich wine, but they will not see it. This is one of the most wonderful passages, really, in all of the Chronicles. The dwarves are in the stable, sitting in a circle, and 
they refuse, and Aslan is standing beside them, and he sends them wine, wonderful food, the sky is beautiful, and they refuse to see it. They refuse to believe that they are out of the stable. You see, said Aslan, they will not let us help them. They have chosen cunning instead of belief. Their prison is only in their own minds, yet they are in that prison and so afraid of being taken in that they cannot be taken out. And this is a picture of the dwarves. So not only do, does Aslan send them all kinds of food and drink, but then they begin to fight over. Now, another uh, part of the last battle, one of my favorite parts, is the part of Emmeth. Emmeth is one of C.S. Lewis's greatest characters. He is a young Calamine soldier who, after fighting for the Calamines and desiring to look upon the face of his god, Tash, enters the stable and meets Aslan. He immediately confesses to Aslan that he has worshipped Tash all his life and now believes that he is doomed to die. Instead, Aslan welcomes the young Emmeth and tells him that no service which is vile can be done to me and none which is not vile can be done to him. Therefore, if any man swear by Tash and keep his oath for the oath's sake. It is by me that he has truly sworn, though he know it not. And it is I who reward him. And if any man do a cruelty in my name, then though he says the name Aslan, it is Tash whom he serves. Beloved, said the glorious one, unless thy desire had been for me, thou wouldst not have sought so long and so truly, for all find what they truly seek. And emeth means truth in Hebrew. So that's the story then of the last battle that all who uh, want to find truth will find truth. And all the good things that are done in the world, according to Lewis, are really done in God's name and not the devil's name. And then there's the wonderful famous passage at the end. But for them it was only the beginning of the real story. These are all the people now who have gone into Aslan's world. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page now at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. So there's a wonderful, glorious ending at the end of the last battle with the children and the adults all running further and further into the new Narnia, which of course is heaven. Now, just a recap of the themes of not only Narnia, but of all of Lewis's writing. Uh, the most important one, I think, is the nature and power of joy. That is the one that caused his uh, conversion from atheism, and that is the one that he considers to be a, a powerful motivator in everybody's life. Uh, of course, goodness, he talks about in all of these stories, always opposed to some form of evil. Uh, temptation is uh, always there. Those of you that remember the screw tape letters, the devil is always trying to tempt people uh, to uh, disobey. So obedience is important. And then finally, a simple life is very important uh, for Lewis. I think we said last week he gave away over half of his money. He never moved out of the little modest house that he lived in. Uh, and his uh, house was shabby, so shabby that when he married Joy, 
uh, very late in life, she undertook to get new drapes and some new, new furniture for him because it was uh, so beaten up over the time. So he, he had a very simple life. Now, there are lots of people who do not like C.S. Lewis and who are critical uh, of him. Uh, and so let's look at uh, a few of the critiques. It's kind of fun. There have been many critiques and commentary on the writings of C.S. Lewis. And in fact, he's kind of out of fashion right now. You know, you don't hear too many people talking about him. But uh, I, I would like to comment on three of those critiques. Uh, there's been a racism charge, uh, and particularly in the last battle. The failure of Susan to be included in the new Narnia. The, of the four children, only three uh, make it, uh, at least literally, in these books into to heaven, to the new Narnia. And Susan uh, has become, uh, we'll talk about her in a little bit, Susan has uh, been excluded from the new Narnia. And some people think that that is terrible because she is uh, not saved, so to speak. And the third area we'll talk about is the traditional, conservative, old-fashioned values and nature of the stories. That is another critique of Lewis. Uh, there was a wonderful um, essay article in the New York Times Magazine in 2005. And in this article, Charles McGrath makes these observations of the Narnia series. By the standards of political correctness, they commit a host of sins. The villains, especially in the last battle, the Calamines, who dwell in the South, are oily cartoon Muslims who wear turbans and pointy-toed slippers and talk funny. And so this is just one example of the critique that Lewis gets for being sort of isolated in his very British, very English uh, world. My um, response to that would be to look at uh, Lewis's other villains. So if you look at his other villains, you see the white witch, who is whiter than white, uh, Uncle Andrew, who is a typical British subject, King Miraz, who is ordinary looking, uh, Lord Sopespian, who is also in Prince Caspian, who's ordinary looking. The Telmarines, who are uh, a, a country that tries to uh, invade Narnia. Uh, all the pompous and evil academics in that hideous strength. Uh, they are very villainous. Uh, and you could go on and on and on to look at all of Lewis's villains. So while it is true that he does create this uh, sort of stereotypical picture of the Calamines, uh, he, he also does that with lots and lots of other kinds of villains. So we can talk about that in just a minute. All right, now another critique is Susan. McGrath writes, then there's the unfortunate business with Susan, the second oldest of the Pevensies, who near the end of the last volume is denied salvation merely because of her fondness for nylons and lipstick because she has reached puberty, in other words, and has become sexualized, end of quote. And Philip Pullman, British fantasy writer of the Dark Materials, you may have seen and read, seen one of his movies and read his books, agrees and despises Lewis for his treatment of Susan, and indeed for all of Lewis's um, I wrote a paper once comparing Lewis and Pullman, uh, and it was uh, a lot of fun to write uh, that, uh, that uh, paper. Um, Susan, I think, in reference to uh, defense of this, um, doesn't, it isn't about nylons and lipstick at all. It's about Susan's freedom. Susan is free to choose what she wants to choose. She's free to go where she wants to go or not go. She decides she doesn't want to go back to Narnia, that Narnia was uh, too imaginative, too, too uh, 
fairy tale. She doesn't want any part of that, so she chooses not to do that. In the meantime, of course, she grows up and, uh, I suppose, wears nylons and uses lipstick. But that's not the real essence, uh, I think, of Lewis's message, which is that Susan is a free being. And if you remember from the great divorce and from the screw tape letters, freedom and choice are really very important to, um, to Lewis. We have to choose our own path. Remember, the road forks every so often, and you always have a choice. And we don't know, I think, um, whether Susan made her choice for all time or not. Lewis wouldn't go down that road, because we don't know exactly uh, where our choices take us or how often we're going to uh, have to make them. So that's my defense of, of Susan. All right, and the, the last one is my favorite one. You remember Lewis called God bourgeois uh, in, in the last week's uh, stories. He said that, you know, God liked bourgeois things. McGrath said, but you sense that among many British critics, the real failure of the books, these are the Narnia Chronicles, is that they're so middle class so affirming of traditional behaviors and role models of old-fashioned Church of England religion and Tory politics. And I think there's a lot of truth in this uh, critique in the sense that there are uh, many British scholars, uh, even in Lewis's own universities, both uh, Oxford and Cambridge, uh, were furious at him for writing all this popular stuff. He was, a, he was a brilliant academic. He wrote beautiful uh, academic, wonderful academic books, but he was always uh, criticized by his colleagues, or many of his colleagues, for writing this popular stuff. And you know, made him a lot of money, and uh, you know, he liked doing it. So I, I think there was a, a, a lot of um, uh, jealousy there. But to use Lewis's own favorite form of rebuttal. To critique something as old-fashioned is not to critique it at all. A critique must elaborate why something is helpful or not helpful, good or evil, consistent in its structure and approach, and I don't think the critics have achieved this level. To call something old-fashioned, so what? You have to say more about it than just that it is old-fashioned. Lewis would point to all those who want to upend something merely for the sake of upending it. He would never say that nothing ever needs change. Rather, he would say, we must use our reason to make those decisions in the very best way and for the right and good reasons and not for the promise of power, fame, and wealth, which he felt uh, a lot of movements uh, devolved into. So, and finally, my favorite, two of my favorite quotes. Uh, atheism turns out to be too simple. If the whole universe has no meaning, we should never have found out that it has no meaning. One of the most brilliant arguments, uh, Lewis uses this in many different forms. Uh, you know, that if everything is absurd, then we would not know that it was absurd. And then the other quote is, I'm on Aslan's side even if there isn't any Aslan to lead it. I'm going to live as like a Narnian as I can, even if there isn't any Narnian. And there's Lucy going mm -hmm. into the into Narnia for the first time. Okay, so now we can take some questions and comments. If you look closely, the lamppost is missing the right-handed lamplighter stand. And it was also it was also missing in the one of the pictures of uh, the white witch Jadis in London on the top of the cab. Because I don't remember exactly, but when she was transported, there was a big fight uh, uh, in one of those 
transported from London back into the wood between the worlds or somewhere. She grabbed that that uh, piece, the piece of yeah. the, the lamp lighter stand, and took it with her yes. into Narnia, where it fell on the ground and, of course, grew into a lamp post missing one half right. of this lamp lighter stand. When Narnia was young, you could plant anything and it would grow. Uh, there's a wonderful scene where um, Diggory and Polly plant a, a caramel, a toffee, and it grows into a beautiful little caramel tree with, with toffees, wonderful soft toffees on them, on the tree. So. And it works the other way because the apples, the, where did they get the apple with the pits in it that cured Diggory's mother? It were, that came from, they brought them from Narnia into this world and they planted one of the seeds in, was it Uncle Andrew's backyard or someone's? Yes. Yeah. That, and that grew into a tree which was knocked down in a storm. Which, which, yeah, it was knocked down and, and then did Andrew? No, no the professor. Yes. Or Diggory. Who, who, Diggory. Some made it into the wardrobe. They made the, from the wood yes. of that tree, they made it into yes. the wardrobe and that was the connection. Yes. Yes. So, um, I wonder if is it possible for adults to read um, fairy tales or say these stories without trying to make the, uh, some sort of allegorical uh, connection or at, um, to just stay in the story itself? I mean, I think it's possible to do that. I, I think. You know, that's uh, the most fun way to do it, is, is to not try to figure out the connection, but kind of let it come to you. Kind of let it, oh, that's what happened. Or, oh, that's why I think this, you know, in other words, to not force it, but to let it happen in just the reading of it. The kind of like the, the chronicles and the biblical connections. You know, it's better to just let it happen, I think. Yes. I just remember when I was reading the um, the petitions making way, way, way back. I mean I just I really loved it, but as time progressed and I read it. Anyway, I read more. There was uh, the line in there, I don't remember specifically the line, where, they, where Aslan is singing Narnia into being. Yes. And then all of a sudden one day, in just my daily readings, I'm reading the Psalms, and there's one of those where God sings the stars into being in one of the Psalms. And I can never remember which one it is, but it's there. And I mean, it's just that sort of rule of something that just pops out of nowhere occasionally. It's just. I still read them every time we go I Well, one of the things that I haven't been and had anything to do with the tales until I came here, and when I was, the whole thing about the nature of atonement, it, it sort of seemed really, not really, like the scene so clear that uh, it was around substitution theory of atonement. And uh, that sort of put me off. I, I wish I could have seen it, you know, uh, because I think that's confining one way of understanding um, atonement theory. Well, we, we did have a whole class on atonement and the problem of, of, that, yeah. of that theory. Yes? Yeah, I didn't read um, Lewis Light of Battle. Actually, Nathan and I college and we were at that bad number as the things the world into being on our car road down in Kansas and we happened to get to read it when we took it at the summer. It's actually a little tough that I had in Kansas. So I love that. Yeah, so but the books are so I grew up in like evangelical circles where Louis was very popular. Definitely not out of fashion. But I think sometimes like I think sometimes those folks miss like the quote at the end like the the embrace of doubt. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, like, I'm not even in this, even if it doesn't exist. And, like, the class, we were talking about like, the critique of, like, being overly confident or, like, 
self interested or into like movements or oh, yeah. like that. And also the like the potential for Christian universalism, you know, like no one in those circles would talk about that. Yes. <laughs> so it was like it, yes. it would have felt like well, I, I, I think I said that I, I thought that the uh, religious writer of evangelicals had kind of co-opted Lewis and and therefore other people were less likely to read him that were not a part of that circle yeah. and that was a shame because there's lots of stuff in there yeah. Yeah. you know aside from the atonement stuff with Aslan and uh, some of the silliness in her Christianity Lewis was not of the evangelical party so you're right it's one of the world's great ironies that he's there saying his papers, of course, are at Wheaton College. And back around maybe 1980, I, I was talking with Clyde Kilby, the curator at a conference, and he, he looked around and said, you know, the irony that always strikes me is Lewis loved his pipe and his beer. We could never hire him where we have his papers. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there's a, there's a great line that I didn't include uh, in research for this class, and that was, in that article that I was uh, telling you about the critique of Lewis, they said that he was fairly middle class and traditional, except for the women that he slept with. And, you know, to say that in evangelical circles would be just <coughs> horrifying. And of course, uh, I didn't put this in, in the presentation, but he took care of his friend's mother for 20 years and it's assumed that he had a, a very sexual relationship with her uh, for most of, the, of that time, or at least for half of that time. Uh, no marriage involved at all. And then, of course, he met Joy when he was, uh, you know, 55 years old. And uh, she was an atheist, a divorcee, uh, converted from Judaism. and. He fell madly in love with her and lived with her for four beautiful years. So those are things I don't think evangelicals would like to talk about very much, but you know, they're very real and make Lewis very um, human, I think. But also the impetus to marry Joy was that she had cancer and she couldn't get National Health Service care in Britain unless she was married to a, a subject of that's right. That was so the there first was a, one. really a, an expedient reason for to, for the marriage. He wasn't going to marry her otherwise. Yeah, but then he did marry her in, in the hospital. In a religious in the, but it, the ceremony took place in the hospital, not her bed. Yes, but that was the second. They were married civilly first. Oh yes, yes, yes. And yes, then, but then, then they, they did have the religious yeah. one. Second. 